And now, dear ladies and gentlemen, our first panel deals with diplomacy in dialogue with history. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Tomasz Cebulski and introduced by Professor Joanna de Duch. The title of the lecture is Complexity of the Contemporary Polish-Israeli Relations Between Sentimentally and Pragmatism. Professor Joanna de Duch is affiliated with the Institute of the Middle and Far East Studies at the Jagiellonian University. Professor de Duch, the floor is yours. Welcome and thank you very much. Um, let me start with uh, this technical uh, issue. I just wanted to share my presentation, which will uh, help me a little bit to navigate uh, navigate us through, the, um, through my very short, but I hope um, full of content lecture. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored, but also uh, I must say that this is this, um, this this occasion and the audience. We have already 150 viewers um, from representing Polish media, Polish and Israeli media, uh, Polish and Israeli academia, uh, uh, diplomats. Uh, and colleagues, analysts, um, scholars, but, but also I noticed <clears throat> having a, a brief, a, a quick look on, on the list of attendees, of, of, of participants, uh, that there are a number of uh, people whom I met uh, uh, over the two decades of my own, uh, let's say, journey um, or my own experience, which I would name or term Polish-Israeli relations. Um, my today's presentation, which is limited to 20 minutes, I guess already like 90 minutes, uh, is aiming to, uh, to, to reflect not on uh, the historical evolution of Polish-Israeli relations, but rather to uh, conceptualize or to answer a question, where are we now? Um, and <clears throat> To maybe to name or to uh, identify or uh, today's uh, stage of uh, Polish-Israeli relation. Um, I tend to think about Polish-Israeli relation uh, for a number of uh, years as an evolving phenomenon that is uh, in terms of the planes that it's taking place uh, somehow synchronized. Uh, what I mean that, of course, we in the 90s, we started with normalization of the of the relation. There was a lot of um, effort and uh, um, there is a lot of effort on both sides to make the relations um, friendly, but also efficient on all kinds in all kinds of di dimension, political, economic. Um, of course, uh, people to people contacts played a crucial role. Um, then, in I would say, in the end of uh, 90s, at the end of 90s, beginning of 2000s, uh, especially in the political <laughs> reality, we started to <clears throat> uh, we started to describe Polish-Israeli relations as strategic one, as a strategic partnership. This was, of course, uh, related to. Uh, Polish orientate Polish, both Polish and Israeli, but let me more focus on Polish perspective, but Polish uh, uh, orientation in foreign policy, uh, which two main pillars uh, uh, were on one hand European integration and on the other hand uh, integration with the trans uh, with, with the um, uh, with NATO. So this um, Atlantic orientation in terms of uh, security policy played a crucial role. Uh, on the other hand, this, uh, a very important role in Polish, Polish strategy played an uh, attempt and then membership in the European Union. What it meant for the Polish-Israeli relations? Basically, I would say it meant that uh, these two pillars were somewhat uh, some, somehow coherent. So there were no conflict, there was no conflict between um, Atl Atlanticism in Polish security policy and um, pro-European um, 
attitudes and efforts to, to join the European Union. Uh, Israel, of course, was observing this and was trying to uh, gain as much as possible in terms of uh, in, in the relation with Poland was looking for uh, was looking for <clears throat> uh, gaining a new uh, hopefully from the Israeli perspective but Polish as well uh, influential partner in international on the international arena especially the European one uh, of course Israel acknowledged the fact not only acknowledged but also um, mm, utilize somehow the fact that Poland uh, since beginning of 90s, but late 90s, beginning of 2000, uh, consequently um, was uh, trying to not only preserve, but also strengthen relationship with the United States. And Polish uh, policy, uh, Middle Eastern policy was very much uh, coherent with the line of Washington. And as I said, everything was uh, more or less coherent. That means that there was no tension between this pro-European and pro-Atlantic uh, dimension of foreign policy. But thing has changed. There were signals already in the beginning of 2000, but uh, I would say in the second decade, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of the second decade of uh, 2000, uh, we see that uh, it's more and more complicated to maintain this uh, uh, or to, man to, to, to maintain in an efficient way these two directions of for Polish foreign policy. That means that this pro-Atlantic orientation is not very, very well seen by our uh, Western partners, uh, Western European partners, uh, I would, which I would um, which I would term uh, for the purpose of this presentation, the Brussels Center, so the Brussels. But of course here, uh, Germany and, and, and France plays a crucial role. And to, to this, I will, uh, I will come back. So summing up, uh, if we want to, if we want to, um, to, if we want to provide any kind of a brief diagnosis of Polish-Israeli relations today, I would say that Polish-Israeli relation is more uh, is not uh, normalization, is not in a stage of normalization and uh, nor in the stage of strategic partnership. I wouldn't say that Polish-Israeli relations are in crisis, but uh, it's a challenge for us scholars, but all, not only scholars, but also analysts, but uh, also activists, diplomats and so on, to um, understand where are we now. And in order to understand it, I believe we need to identify the most, uh, the, 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 the crucial and the most powerful and influential factors shaping Polish-Israeli relations. Um, and for the purpose of this presentation, I, 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 try to, I, I try to do it. I know uh, that this is something that needs to be continued. Uh, this, the work, this study needs to be continued and needs a really in deep re reflection. But let me just uh, point out a couple of a uh, few uh, um, few factors which I identify as a key uh, key factors uh, uh, with regard to shaping the dynamic of Polish-Israeli relations. Most of them are related to the nature and character of contemporary international um, environment, international system. So what was already mentioned and very accurately um, uh, pointed by Ambassador uh, Ben Svi. Uh, so multilateralism uh, or multilateral, multilateralization of bilateral relations uh, which is also uh, a fact for, uh, and which is also true for Polish-Israeli relations <clears throat> in terms in the in 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 in, in terms of Polish-Israeli relation uh, is a dilemma between uh, Europeanization and Atlanticism, as said. So now let me stop for a moment on these two. Um, directions of Polish-Israeli relations, of, the, of these two dimensions of Polish-Israeli relations from the Polish perspective, very uh, important uh, for conceptualization and operationalization of Israeli politics. So on one hand, as said, <clears throat> after joining the European Union, Polish foreign policy 
towards or Polish policy towards Israel was a part of wider uh, Europeanization ex uh, experience. Membership resulted with observable reassessment of the Poland's approach to Israel. Uh, the Europeanization of the um, um, the Europeanization of Polish uh, attitude towards Israel resulted with decreasing willingness uh, among the new member states, including Poland. Poland played here a very important role to provide international support for Israel and its conflict uh, and for uh, for Israel in the context of uh, its conflict with uh, uh, with Palestinians. That means that uh, uh, the the, the, um, the, the wishes that were, uh, or the um, hopes formulated by Israeli diplomats and the Israeli political elite uh, right before the uh, accession of uh, Central Eastern European states to European, into the, to, to, to accession to European Union, uh, it turned that, remember the new member states actually <clears throat> Uh, tried to did not provide a substantive support for Israel within the European Union uh, with regard to the conflict with Palestinian rather uh, tried to and this was the case of Poland tried to uh, balance its its position and uh, it's term in the literature the, the the approach of Central Eastern European states including Poland is termed the literature the policy of equal distance, which substituted its previous pro-Arab policy after the end of the Cold War. Simultaneously, Polish diplomacy made it, made it clear that its aspiration to promote Israeli-European relations should be developed and pursued in the line with the EU preferred solution in the Middle East. What are the EU preferred solution in the Middle East? So basically, in short, without going into detail, Two, uh, there are two aspects. One aspect is a state, two-state solution uh, for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And the second aspect is, and therefore, the occupation of the West Bank, Israeli occupation of the West Bank is illegal, entirely illegal. Um, so uh, what we observed in right after the, uh, the accession, I would say, till uh, 2011, 2015, um, uh, Poland started or uh, uh, in, in a quite an evolving ma uh, manner uh, was closer and closer to the Brussels uh, perception. <clears throat> of course, this has been noticed by Israelis uh, and Israeli, by Israel and Israelis um, and it caused some kind of uh, disappointment. Um, things has changed, um, I would say, in the uh, not in a re revolutionary manner, but things started to change already in 2009 uh, when um, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu <clears throat> came to power for the first time, the, when, when his first, uh, when, he, when he assumed uh, prime minister office in 2009. And, uh, and his policy towards Palestinians uh, was, um, uh, uh, mm, House um, criticism from Brussels and the Western capitals. Uh, this Pol Central Eastern European states and Poland tried to preserve quite a neutral stance as much as it was possible. But in a certain moment, it wasn't possible anymore. That means that the pressure from the uh, Western capitals, like uh, from uh, mainly or mostly from France, but also from Sweden, Ireland, Belgium, uh, caused a certain ten tension without the European Union. And Central Eastern European states, Poland less, but still, uh, was accused not to understand the European values, not to understand the consensus seeking culture of the European Union, and blocking uh, um, and Polish, uh, but even more Czech, Romanian or Hungarian position uh, was seen as a um, result, a consequence of the Europeanization of the foreign policy. Um, in other words, this is something that is proved by the empirical research 
I mean the de-Europeanization of the foreign policy of the Central Eastern European states is actually followed by renationalization uh, of the national or of the foreign policy, which, which goes together with uh, prioritizing of national interests, with, which goes together with uh, uh, seeking for diversification of uh, multilateral or of contacts beyond European Union and outside the European Union. And here I would say uh, <clears throat> we come to this, uh, we come to this, the, to, to the point of, uh, uh, of Atlanticism. Atlanticism as a um, counterbalance uh, for uh, lack of um, in, uh, insurance from the European side for the European for the uh, Central Eastern European state security, of course, Poland, uh, Poland as well. So uh, when we think of how uh, this pro-Atlantic orientation influenced Polish Israeli relations, I would say one uh, can uh, one can uh, I would quote here um, um, one of. Uh, I, I, I would recall a quotation from the interview I conducted recently in 2019 for the purpose of my research, um, where one of my interlocutors said, Poland tries to be careful and consider Americans' Middle Eastern policy, their views and argument. It has a lot to do with Poland's security strategy. The mechanism, this mechanism applies to relation and position towards Israel as well. So Polish Middle Eastern policy which is very much, uh, which has been in, in previous times very much influenced by European Union, uh, or tend to be more and more influenced by the Europe fact of the membership, started to be again more, um, uh, uh, much more influenced by the relation, close relation with the United States. What does it mean? It means that Poland does not have, does not pay too much attention, Polish diplomacy does not pay too much attention to. Um, uh, to Middle East. Middle East is not, is not a priority for, for Polish, a priority region for Polish foreign policy. And if it thinks about the Middle East and if it's uh, define, uh, I, uh, define its Middle Eastern policy, then it does it through the lens of cooperation with the United States. Uh, what it can, uh, uh, what, 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 what can happen uh, uh, apart from uh, bringing the uh, parties like Poland and Israel together due to the Atlantic orientation, we will have a side effect of, um, uh, which I would uh, name uh, um, tensions or which a side effect, which is a tension uh, on the European, on the European, European Union level. Um, um, yeah. <clears throat> How much time do I have? I'm sorry, Eva. Uh, maybe we can go to conclusions. <laughs> yes, we can. I, I'm absolutely there. So, um, uh, so these are these are conclusions actually. Um, so, this trying to um, look at the uh, the relation between Poland uh, as a country, as a state, as a play actor in international relations, and Israel as well, rather than. Uh, Poles and Israelis from the social perspective, I would say what plays a role now is uh, national interest, uh, which is uh, or and this vision of uh, national community, the importance of states is very sometimes uh, uh, performed and contrary to liberal values. So what happens both in Israel and in Poland national uh, community and national interests matters more than anything else, sometimes more than long-lasting strategic cooperation with other partners. Uh, I posted here a question, does the economy uh, really matter? Uh, if we say maybe it should, if the pragmatic uh, relations are, uh, are what we were really looking for, um, but uh, looking into details, and I'm sure that uh, uh, representatives of Polish embassy, Polish diplomats, but not only Polish, but also Israeli diplomats would prove that uh, in the broader context, European-Israeli context, um, Polish-Israeli uh, economic exchange 
is uh, not sharing a great portion of the, of the exchange in terms of trade and investment. That means that economy does not really matter for Poland and Israel. That means also that high politics does not really matter in terms of direct relations. It matters for the indirect relation and the international context. Uh, the last question I'm going to leave as a really closing uh, word. Uh, and here, what I try to do in conclusion, I, I, would, I, I have identified three uh, main trends of um, international relations, of contemporary international relations, which impact the uh, Polish-Israeli relation. One is the contestation of multilateralism. The second one is the securitization of the public policies. And the third one is extreme pragmatism, which is which means that we are prior prioritizing the own subjective and subjectively defined national interests. And this applies both for Israel and both for Poland. What does it mean for two parties? It means that the uh, the space for strategic long lasting alliances is shrinking. So now uh, Poland and Israel, but broadly states are not seeking for long lasting friendships and friendship and alliances, rather the cooperation that brings a certain, um, certain outcomes uh, defined in terms of realpolitik. Then what uh, in, the, the, the observable increase of securitization of public policies where everything can become a security methods like health, um, absolutely everything, any kind of narrative, any kind of poly public policy can become a, become a security matter. Even culture can become a security issue. When, when everything becomes a security issue, what happens then? We have, again, shrinking space for pluralism and consensual style of doing things. So we will have less and less uh, space for mutual dialogue. And this extreme pragmatism uh, will result with lack of trust. What we can do, of course, we have to uh, do what the, uh, the, this initiative of the conference is manifesting. We should really struggle for civil society, act support the civil society activities. We should promote people-to-people uh, -people interactions and we should really still uh, work and uh, look for shared universal, universal values and norms, which are not necessarily uh, I want to be understood, and this is my really last sentence, I'm not against uh, nation state at all. I think this is something that nobody will, uh, for a long time, will, will find nothing that can replace uh, nation, nation, nation state in, in, uh, in international relations. But the, orient but the uh, orientation of, uh, of, in policies of the nation state in international relations needs to be a consensus seeking culture. Uh, so I promise to say one more, and if you let me, if, if, will you let me, my, probably we will continue in a, in a discussion. There are two things which, from my, from my perspective, does not play any role in current Polish-Israel relations. They are somehow hidden, but they will play a role. They might play a role when some uh, elites, um, some... Um, political actors will decide to politicize them. One is an issue of uh, is, uh, the Polish passports carried by Israelis or obtained by Israelis. We, you all, we, we, all, we all know the numbers are quite uh, significant already. And Polish passports, as Sharon Pardew was joking uh, some months ago, is a, a fundamental need of Israelis when they were standing under COVID, when COVID in, uh, in, uh, in April started, when the lockdown uh, related to COVID started, Israelis were standing in a long queue to Polish consulate in order to, um, uh, to, uh, to submit the documents. This is something that complete, completely does not exist in the uh, bilateral dialogue, narrative, whatever, but it might become an issue. A second thing is that is sometimes here and there recalled and uh, is a huge issue in Polish-Israeli relation and broader Polish-Jewish relation is the property claims. But uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I believe that also our participants has something to do, to, to, has, some, has something to say about it, uh, but there is no climate today and there is no re um, relevant, there, we, we cannot even identify parties who, which, who could 
um, or actors who could really discuss the issue as an issue in internet uh, in Polish Israeli relations. So thank you very much uh, for your patience. Um, I have to finish here uh, and I'm happy for continuation in our uh, panel discussion. Thank you, Professor Deduch, for your lecture. And thank you also for all your uh, questions. We are going to collect them. And um, Dr. Tomasz Cybulski, who is the moderator of the first panel, is going to um, use to ask some of them uh, later on after the panel. So thank you very much once again for all your questions. And uh, now, Please welcome Dr. Tomasz Cebulski, uh, the moderator of the first panel. Uh, Dr. Cebulski is graduate of International Relations and Institute of the Middle and Far East Studies at the Aguilonian University. He holds a PhD in the field of political um, studies, author of uh, scientific and popular science articles dealing with the issues of the politics of memory, identity and genocide studies. Dedica dedicated Museum Guide, author of the book Auschwitz after Auschwitz of, um, on the formation of memory around the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. Tomasz, please, let's start. Myself. Uh, welcome uh, once more, Your Excellencies and distinguished guests. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to uh, moderate the first conference panel titled Diplomacy in Dialogue with History. Uh, I would like to invite to this panel uh, the four guests that I already see on the screen. Welcome. So the Polish Ambassador to Israel, Mr. Marek Majerowski, thank you for being with us. Um, a former Israeli Ambassador to Poland, uh, Mr. Tzvi Ravder, welcome. Uh, Director General of Israel Council on Foreign Relations and of World uh, Jewish Congress Israel, Dr. Lawrence Weinbaum, uh, welcome. And uh, Professor Yamna Didu, who delivered this uh, very compact uh, but a fascinating lecture, which uh, gives us a slightly different perspective on, uh, on uh, our mutual relations and its future. Um, after a millennium of Polish-Jewish relations, uh, 72 years of Polish-Israeli relations. Uh, the last 30 years uh, after renewal seem to be only a certain appendix to the bigger picture. Uh, yet those 30 years uh, are fundamental for understanding of where we are now. And I sincerely believe that uh, they can become a certain role model of how two nations that derive themselves from a common cultural and geographical territory and ground uh, can process contested history in order to build a better future. And my first question to the panelists, uh, and I would like to uh, each and every panelist to answer and uh, tackle with this question, is what uh, is the major obstacle in Polish-Israeli mutual relations and uh, how it can be overcome by both partners, especially an obstacle for the year 2020. And uh, I would kindly ask uh, Ambassador Magyarowski to, to provide us with an answer. I just had to unmute myself. Ah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, let me start with an anecdote. Um, as you probably know, I used to be a journalist for over 20 years and I keep devouring news. Uh, I'm addicted. Uh, to this world. And for the last few months, I've been following the coverage of the coronavirus in the Israeli media. Uh, during the first wave, whenever journalists and experts were talking about the pandemic situation in uh, Europe, they used to mention Spain, Italy, or Belgium as uh, examples of countries which were apparently collapsing. And on the other hand, they pointed at Germany or Austria as those which were coping pretty well with the pandemic. There were charts, maps, statistics, live reporting from uh, Paris, Brussels, Rome, everything labeled as Europe. But quite oddly, they never ever mentioned Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, or Lithuania. The fact that uh, 
those countries uh, were also dealing relatively well with the pandemic. However, in the world of the Israeli media, they are plainly not Europe. Europe ends somewhere on the outskirts of Berlin. But during the second wave, Poland, Romania, and Czechia miraculously became European. Charts, maps, and statistics were shown on uh, Israeli TV to prove that these European countries found themselves in, uh, in a shambles. In brief, Eastern European countries are worth reporting on when there is something wrong with them. Eastern Europe is not worth reporting and basically does not exist when something good and positive occurs in Poland, Croatia or Bulgaria. I'm not going to blame the Israeli journalists for that. Uh, it's the legacy. My conclusion is as follows. We do remember when and why we re-established our diplomatic relations, but we tend to forget why we severed them in the first place. Poland and Israel were on the opposite sides of the Cold War rivalry between two political and ideological camps. We were separated by the Iron Curtain, not geographically, of course, because Israel is not located in Europe, but mentally. Poland was east, Israel was west. Before the pandemic, I spoke with uh, dozens of Israelis who uh, had visited Poland for the first time in their lives, two weeks or a month or three months before, and all but a few were saying to me, you know, I expected to see and to experience something completely different, a sad, drab, colorless, cold country with frustrating history and nationalistic tendencies. And what I saw after landing in Warsaw, Krakow or Gdansk was a Western country in Eastern Europe, modern, bustling, technologically advanced and friendly. To put it bluntly, the legacy of communism is deeply rooted in the perception of Poland in Israel as post-communist and backward. And conversely, Israel is still perceived by many Poles as insecure as a Middle East country. And uh, you know pretty well what Middle East means. It means uh, missiles, suicide bombings, riots, ethnic and religious conflicts. Of course, these things do happen in Israel from time to time, as much as Poland can be sad and cold. But I would prefer to see more stories in the Israeli media about Polish video games and read more articles in the Polish newspapers about, for instance, the Israeli contemporary cinema and not necessarily about Fauda invasions and suicide bombings abound. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And the media coverage will be also discussed a little bit later, but this is a very precious remark. And uh, now I'd like to ask the same question. So what are the obstacles in mutual Polish relations uh, and how they can be overcome? Uh, the former Ambassador, Mr. Tzvi Ravna. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you, thank you all. And uh, uh, it reminds me the, uh, the ambassador told an episode, so I will tell also a little story uh, which will lead to the question. Uh, in 1986, uh, the communist government of Poland sent uh, uh, the uh, late uh, uh, director of the Jewish theater, uh, Shimon Shurmie, uh, to Israel on a diploma secret diplomatic mission to talk about relations. Uh, he met with uh, uh, then Foreign Minister Isaac Shamir, himself born in uh, Poland. Uh, uh, and the problem was, I was a note taker, uh, deputy director, I was a note taker. Uh, but there were only the three of us and 
uh, 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 Shurmye wanted to speak in uh, Polish. Uh, uh, Itzhak Shamir said, well, my Polish is not so good, but what about Yiddish? And they started this diplomatic uh, uh, meeting in Yiddish. And since I, I had some knowledge of Yiddish, I was able to, to make the protocol correctly. And then I showed it to, uh, to Shamir to, to be sure that this is, uh, that I took the right notes about the, the meeting. So now, why am I telling this story apart from the memories is that to your question, we have, uh, I think, good relations that were, uh, that were uh, really uh, uh, detailed here uh, by Professor uh, uh, Joanna, indeed. Uh, but obstacles, unfortunately, uh, still the, I would say, historical and slash Jewish uh, issues. Uh, because, and that this is quite, rather surprising in a way, because uh, um, uh, the two countries are rather close in many, in many fields, and it was manifested during those 30 years in, in, a, in any possible dimension, the, the, the security and, and economy and tourism that was mentioned here and culture even, uh, um, uh, and politically, even though, yeah, sometimes uh, with the uh, European Union, as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we had uh, differences, uh, but, uh, but still, on the other hand, the uh, cooperation within the framework of uh, uh, Visegrad 4, uh, that Poland was quite active and Israel, uh, jo uh, joined in a way uh, to this dialogue. So it was, uh, it, and, and even ideologically, politically ideologically, we, we have uh, uh, quite same governments in Poland and Israel, right wing, very pro-religion, but okay, not, uh, not, not to uh, exaggerate, not uh, on abortions, thanks God, uh, we have a little bit different uh, policies, but in, in essence, uh, the, uh, these are right wing uh, governments that ideologically are quite, uh, quite close to each other. However, uh, it's not the first time that the problems that we are uh, facing, we are having in the last two years on these uh, obstacles, these, uh, constituted these obstacles, the, the historical and Jewish uh, questions, uh, in a way came as a surprise because we had, you had in Poland, um, uh, right-wing governments before. Uh, uh, the late Nieboszczyk uh, Lech uh, Kaczynski was the president and his brother, a twin brother, was the prime minister, Jaroslaw Kaczynski. And uh, we didn't have, to such an extent, uh, controversies at that time. There were some arguments, there was always an, an argument, but not to this extent and in, as in the last uh, uh, two years. Now, what is, uh, uh, what is uh, how to, to solve this uh, problem indeed? Uh, I would say, as far as history is concerned, you know, I was, I was when I was ambassador, uh, it always uh, surprised me when I was asked by several people, including journalists uh, or academics, what is, not to mention politicians, what is the historical policy of the Israeli government? And I always surprised me because I said, what, what, what is it, political, his, uh, 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 po historical policy of the government? We don't have, uh, we have historians. Uh, and uh, each one is, is, of course, entitled to their own uh, uh, opinions about it. It's, it's not a matter of policy. In 1984, of Orwell, there was a historical uh, policy, but not, uh, uh, not in a, it, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be in place in a in democratic uh, 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 political uh, environment. Uh, so I think we should leave the history to historians. Uh, Thank you about Jew, other Jewish issues like the property and uh, unfortunately the, the, the initiative again of banning of the ritual slaughter uh, in Poland, where, which is also again going to, to raise another obstacle uh, soon if it, if it happens. We, we better leave those questions, even the, the property, which is very, very uh, 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 difficult uh, question indeed, but to uh, deal less with the political aspects and more with the uh, concrete, specific uh, attempts of solutions, even if, if with this property issue, uh, to try and find what is possible, what is not possible, what is possible for Poland, what is not possible. To be Thank you very much. not sentimental and not controversial. Mm -hmm. if, if we manage uh, to have less, uh, to make these uh, arguments less political and more 
historical, professional, uh, uh, candid, open. Arguments are okay. Arguments are okay. We should not be afraid of uh, arguments and some sort of controversies, but they may lead to, uh, 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 to fruitful uh, uh, dialogue rather than to confrontation. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, that was a very important point. And now the same question about obstacles and uh, how to overcome it uh, is coming for Dr. Lawrence Weinbaum. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this event. Uh, I know from my own experience what it is to put something like this together, and I just want to say that I admire their determination and their professionalism. Um, I would also like to say something else, and uh, that's a word of admiration for Marek Magyarovsky, who arrived in this country a couple of years ago, having received, a, well, we could say a very difficult set of cards, uh, and has done an extraordinary job in diffusing tensions. I don't always agree with him, uh, but I think he's been a model diplomat. Uh, his background is in journalism, but I think uh, even all diplomatic uh, professionals if you, if you have a lot to learn. I'll put mind, that in writing with a stand on it. With, this, with my signature. Can you please mute, can you, can you please mute Larry right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I, I think that I'm going to echo uh, what our friend Stirav Neres said. I think that the great challenge in uh, our, the great obstacle to the improvement of our bilateral relations is really the historical legacy. And I think we're deluding ourselves to think, even for a moment, that we can somehow put that aside and only think about the future. Um, I would argue that the ambiance, particularly in Poland, has changed somewhat. Um, why do I say that? I recall very well, uh, it was about uh, 2000, uh, when I went with the late great uh, Miriam Makavia, with whom I had the great pleasure of working for many years on the Israel-Poland Friendship Association, to a lecture by Jan Tomasz Gross, who had just published his book Neighbors, he had arrived in Israel, and the two of us went to hear him speak. And I said to her jokingly, after hearing this very chilling lecture, I don't think this is the best uh, venue and the best time and place for us to uh, attempt to uh, increase our membership. Everyone having been under the impression of this, uh, the, the terrible things that Gross had described. But I must tell you, I was entirely mistaken on that time because I saw at the time that it had absolutely no effect in the, the, the level of relations. I think people on the Israeli side didn't react nearly as harshly as they did to what happened uh, some years later. And to this, I'm referring uh, the adoption of this very unfortunate piece of legislation with which uh, we are all familiar. And I think the fact that that came from the top and the emotions ran very deep, I think it was an ill-considered uh, move and I think that the Polish side was quite surprised at how Israel and how the Jewish world uh, reacted to this. So I think that uh, if, we, if, if we look at the context between Israel and Poland, and I can say having been a co-organizer of a number of big events with our colleagues at the Polish Institute for International Affairs, uh, this just cannot be swept under the carpet. I think we have to say, yes, this is a challenge, but it can also be an opportunity. And I give you just one example. When we had our last uh, bilateral meeting in February of this year, just before the onset of COVID, we decided we must tackle this so-called elephant in the room immediately. In other words, we can't uh, pretend that this historical baggage doesn't exist. And so the first session of a very long conference dealt with these historical challenges. I completely agree with uh, Ambassador Ravner, and I've been saying this for a long time, History has to be left to historians. And the problem is that the public doesn't understand that they don't have the tools to deal with these issues. And unfortunately, um, you can find guilty parties uh, in both countries, including sadly, and I say this with a heavy heart, here in Israel, including some very senior uh, politicians who felt that they can, they can uh, reinsert into the discourse some very problematic uh, stereotypes. And this, of course, is not helpful to our dialogue. So I think that's what we must recognize. In other words, relations between Israel and Poland will never, or at least not in the immediate future, be completely comparable to relations with other countries. And what's especially interesting is if we look at Israel's relations with all the countries of Europe, all of which have a tangled 
Jewish past, history generally doesn't pose the obstacle that it does. And we heard uh, Ambassador Magyarovsky mention all the other countries of uh, Western and uh, East Central Europe, whether they're in what part of Europe we can discuss, but in the relations with those countries, even countries which have a very, uh, once had a great Jewish population, which was uh, murdered during the Shoah, this doesn't seem to be a kind of sticking point um, that it does that it does with our relations. So I think that's what we mm -hmm. that's what we have to uh, face, and we have to figure out a way that we can uh, we can move forward. And lastly, uh, earlier in the call, I cannot remember now who who was speaking about it. Perhaps it was our friend um, Ambassador Ben Svi, whom I also have the pleasure for knowing for more years than I care to admit. I think we were both young and handsome then, what we are now, I prefer not to, not to mention. Um, when he was speaking about the different institutions um, who should be involved in any historical discussion, um, I would certainly say first and, uh, first and foremost it has to be the Polish Center for Holocaust Research of the Polish Academy of Science, uh, because the historians of that organization, and here I speak as a fellow historian, have really done pioneering work with tremendous courage and determination, and they must be a part uh, of any dialogue. Finally, the last thing I want to say is, and I always like to end on an optimistic note, but I think also if you look at some developments in Poland in well, very recent times, this doesn't uh, bode well for the future. Just as an example, um, we know Poland has a new Minister of Education. Um, I am very concerned uh, what the message that the Ministry of Education will insert into textbooks going forward. And make no mistake, what appears in textbooks is going to influence successive generations. This is not a trivial matter by any means. So that's something that really has to be monitored. Um, so uh, I, I think we have to work hard on this, but we must work on it. Thank you very much. So as for now, we are sharing very similar fears, uh, that's for sure. And that's a good starting point. Uh, the same question about um, obstacles uh, to Professor Jan Deduch. Uh, if you could elaborate in just a few words. Yes, of course. I'll just to, uh, I will um, try to be brief as possible. Few points. Uh, in a way, these are this is a summary of what has been said um, before. Uh, first of all, the main obstacle is the politicization of the content of social cultural. Um, and people-to-people -people relation. So it applies very much to uh, now to history, a common history narrative about a common history, education of, um, uh, of, of uh, education about the common uh, history, but common commemoration, but it can apply to other, um, other realms of uh, social and cultural relation between the states. So less politics is uh, better than um, uh, the, the purposeful politicization is something that might be an, that, that is an obstacle. The second thing is using the um, this the content of the social and cultural and historic uh, historically rooted relation for the internal um, policy purposes. Sometimes very uh, defined in a very short uh, last big interest, but uh, just for uh, political campaign, electoral campaign and so on. And this way we observed in Israel and this we observed in Poland as well. So using the content of, content of the relation Polish is really Polish Jewish relations for the internal political uh, purposes. The second and the third thing and the last one is, uh, I think what has been said also here, Polish and uh, Israeli uh, political ruling elites are to some extent similar and the way how they perceive the uh, national community, the importance of state and um, um, the, 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 the importance of the security issues. I would say that this is the obstacle. This is the general obstacle. I think we've lost. We've okay, I'm back. Ah. Uh, I'm, I hope that all is well. I just would yeah. say that this closeness or the, the similarities and the ide ideological uh, character of Polish and Israeli ruling elites, governments, uh, leaders, is an obstacle. Why? Because uh, uh, tend this, this, this ten the tendency to radicalization of national narrative. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the, pr the presentation of uh, 
liberal values versus national uh, national values, contra national values, is a trend that is not helping in uh, in, in in shaping. cooperation and dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Duduk. And uh, the last question which I'd like to open to, to all the panelists and uh, to follow the idea of uh, Dr. Weinbaum to finish on a more optimistic note. Uh, if you are to name uh, the common and strategic unifying objectives that Israel and Poland may have as of 2020, what would they be? Ambassador Magyarowski, uh, we need, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry again. Uh, we could probably speak for hours and end about our uh, common objectives. Uh, let me just uh, refer briefly to one particular area, uh, namely security. Um, Middle East, uh, the Middle East has always been a, a geopolitical powder keg. So to to speak, uh, with uh, far reaching global implications from oil prices um, affecting worldwide economic trends to Islamic terrorism to subsequent waves of refugees. Uh, Poland has always been involved more or less officially in uh, Middle East politics. Uh, stability in this region is equally important for the political and economic stability of Europe and by extension of Poland. Uh, lower oil prices mean less burden for the overall economy. Less terrorism and ethnic strife mean less migrations. Uh, therefore, Poland is very much interested in promoting peace in the region. As you all remember, and it was also mentioned by Ambassador Ben Svi, we hosted a Middle East conference in Warsaw in uh, February 2019, which I believe was um, a milestone in the long hatched process of the so-called normalization of ties between mm -hmm. Israel and a number of uh, Muslim countries. Uh, we greet all those agreements signed recently uh, by Israel with uh, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. They are about to sign another one with uh, Sudan. And of course, we are ready to assist Israel in its efforts to uh, enhance the network of political and uh, economic cooperation in the wider Middle East for a common good. So uh, this could be a reasonable, if ambitious, common Thank objective you. in the months and years to come. Thank you. It sounds, it sounds very ambitious, but I think we are both very ambitious in our undertakings. Uh, I would like to ask uh, right now, uh, Ambassador Sviravna, you need to unmute first. Yeah, uh, indeed. Uh, uh, yeah, well, as, as mentioned earlier, really uh, the, the, the two uh, governments and uh, the two uh, states have really quite uh, quite many objectives in common in in uh, in general uh, uh, foreign policy. Uh, le le let me just uh, highlight: uh, we are, I think, uh, in a, a very unique group uh, nowadays of uh, very close, very very close relations countries with the uh, uh, American current uh, president. Maybe for one more week, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> really, I think that uh, it's an opportunity and threats at the same time. <laughs> if he is going to lose the, those elections, um, I'm afraid that both in Jerusalem and in Warsaw, there will be quite many uh, people who will be very sorry for that. Uh, in, in this respect, we are really, really, I mean, Poland and Israel very, very close to each other. Uh, but, but it's... I, of course, I think the uh, your Polish relations and Israeli-American relations will survive any administration in uh, uh, in Washington because this is a, a very important uh, interest for both uh, countries. Uh, each one in his own uh, in its own interest. Indeed, 
but it's it's something that uh, unites us in, in a way. The, uh, those special relations of both countries uh, with the uh, uh, with the United uh, States. Even though you got already a free visa system with the Americans, we haven't yet, in spite of being so close to the administration there. But never mind. The most important thing is that they they provided some uh, uh, normalization agreements with Arab countries and moved their uh, their embassy to Jerusalem. Well, I hope that Poland maybe sometime will come, that Poland also will move its embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, but in any case, uh, the same goes for Europe. I think uh, with, all, with all the problems that Poland is having with Europe uh, these days, um, also Israel's relations with Europe are not, are not simple, are quite uh, complicated uh, in many ways. So it's, it's again something that uh, uh, unites us. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, those uh, last 30 years, I think, uh, demonstrated those uh, close relations in the most uh, important uh, issues that we were having. Apart from whatever we, we've said about the historical and Jewish issues, indeed, there, there, there are obstacles. There are obstacles that they are not going away, unfortunately. But, but really, uh, otherwise, and with any different government in Poland and any different government uh, in Israel, those relations will continue because these ca our countries are close, whether because of the, the 1,000 uh, years of, uh, uh, of uh, joint uh, history of Jews and Poles, I don't know, uh, or maybe because of the interests of modern Poland, modern Israel, uh, but they are close and I believe that they will uh, sustain and uh, uh, conquer any uh, possible divisions in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, now, Dr. Weinbaum, uh, what are the, the hopes? <laughs> uh, we need you to unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. I think that the previous speakers have very well articulated uh, the answers to that question. I think the only thing that hasn't been mentioned is the common secret weapon uh, that we have, and that's the Polish mothers, um, who we, we, can never, we can never ignore in any such discussion. Um, but I think certainly what uh, Professor Didu has uh, said, uh, whether, whether Poland will adopt a, a more European or an Atlanticist orientation is something very important. I, I think uh, I completely concur once again. Uh, no, I'm not receiving any royalties from uh, Ambassador Ravner. I think that when you... Uh, if you were to draw a scorecard, uh, both the Israeli and Polish sides have so much in common. And were it not for some of these niggling historical issues, the cooperation would be even deeper and there would be less common suspicion. But the fact that both of these countries, whether for better or worse, we won't get into that, identify themselves as countries with a very strong national ethos um, and with a certain common idea and a common understanding. I mean, this is not a coincidence. If you talk to Poles who come to Israel and Israelis who come to Poland, they very often speak of feeling at home each in the other's country in a way that they don't feel in other parts of the world. I don't think that's a coincidence. So I do think there is a certain, there is a certain common, uh, no, Weltanschauung or Poglan Maschrat, I don't know what you want to call it, um, which bodes well, which bodes well for the future. But there are those, there are those, there are those challenges because at the end of the day, sentiment is one thing, but national interest uh, is, is another. But I think we can make a very strong case that there are very close national interests. The interests co coincide between Israel and Poland. I just want to say one last thing in conclusion. What's very interesting is uh, if I look at my, the evolution of my own thinking in the 1990s, um, I, I believed that as, uh, as Poland would draw closer to the European Union, um, I thought that, for example, anti-Semitism in Poland would, would decline, thinking that the European Union would be a positive influence. And I've changed my thinking on that because I don't think necessarily the European Union, at least in, in these matters, is necessarily the positive influence that we would have hoped it to be. Um, so that's basically what, what I can say in a couple of moments. Thank you very much, Dr. Weinbaum. And uh, Professor Deduch, uh, your take on the chances and opportunities? You need to unmute, you need to unmute. 
Yeah, I would say that I agree with everything that has been said, absolutely. And what can I add? Maybe some kind of uh, alternative scenario. Let's, let's think of really alternation of power in Washington, which can be the, the game changer. Um, and I believe that uh, Poland might find itself in a critical uh, uh, position in terms of its position in the EU and its Middle Eastern policy, which uh, all diplomats with whom I recently talked, which I carried the interviews, were saying that Middle East is not a priority of Polish foreign policy due to the lack of resources, due to the other directions, uh, mostly European and Eastern European and Western European. But uh, it can become a, really a problem for Polish diplomacy if Trump wins, if Netanyahu decides to annex, uh, decides to go uh, go go on with the annexation of the West Bank of the, or the at least some parts of the West Bank, then Poland, then European Union will definitely uh, will try to um, to 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 take a voice to to influence the situation to to play a play a role, and Poland will may uh, find itself in a very very critical uh, position because differently than in Poland, the Palestinian-Israel issue, um, which is already in Poland uh, seen as an internal problem, not an external problem, not an international problem. For the uh, Western European countries like Germany, uh, German public opinion, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Ireland, Sweden, and so on, this is a top priority issue in the uh, foreign mm -hmm. policy agenda of the EU. So I would end with this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful and informed panel. Uh, thank you for actually addressing the question, which is uh, very commonly shown in the in the forum asked by our attendees about what happens next if the elections in the United States goes uh, the other way than uh, they used to be going five years ago. And uh, that is probably the most common last question: What happens to relations if President Trump loses uh, his position? Uh, thank you very much for, for your impact uh, on the Polish-Jewish relations for those decades and uh, for sharing your perspective with us today. Uh, thank you very much.